Well, good morning. Good to see all of you. Another beautiful day to gather together and worship. One of the things as believers that we should have that, that seems to come and go too easily uh, as we allow the world uh, to steal our true and lasting joy. Uh, as children of God who've been redeemed, we should have joy above all else. Uh, especially knowing that our Father, who is steadfast in his faithfulness and in his love, has saved and redeemed and is holding us firm forever. So I want to start off as we think about his steadfast love and the joy that we have in him by reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. It says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised and who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angel, angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's stand in worship that our God is for us.
If you will, turn with me to the book of Micah, chapter 7, as we continue standing in honor and reverence of God's Word. This morning we'll be reading from Micah, chapter 7, verses 18 through 20. The prophet writes these words, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? For the remnant of his inheritance, he does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. You may be seated as we enter into a time of prayer and confession. As we read this passage, we're reminded of, of God's holiness, of God's righteousness, and of our need for constant repentance and faith. So this morning, I want to open up just a few moments of silent time for silent confession, and then I will close us in a prayer of corporate confession. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning recognizing that you are the one true living God. You are holy. You are perfect. You are righteous. And Father, when we consider our own lives, our own hearts and flesh, we're reminded of the sin that remains in us. Even as we have gathered to worship today, we have sinned this morning in thought. We may have sinned in word or deed. And Father, we know sin separates us from you. But we come this morning confessing our sin, recognizing that our sin is against you, is against your word. It transgresses your law. But Father, we also come in faith knowing that Christ has made a way that we might be forgiven of our sins, that we might turn from our sin and turn to him. He was born of a virgin, lived the sinless life we could not live, died a sacrificial death in our place, 
and then after three days was raised from the dead where he would eventually ascend to the right hand of, of the Father where he sits now beside you interceding for us even as we speak praying for his people so this morning we rejoice in that hope we thank you that your word guarantees us that if we are faithful to confess our sin he is faithful to forgive us of all our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness we thank you for that this morning we rejoice in that this morning and now I pray that we would sing with hearts of thanksgiving that we would show the joy and honor that you have given us in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and respond through singing. Oh, fount of love, divine that glows, from my Savior's bleeding side Where sinners trade their filthy rags For His righteousness of light oh, Mercy cleansing every stain Now rushing o'er us like a flood And there the wretch and violent Omnipresent. 
Spirit of grace, we His people, Christ did ransom to the glory of His name. gather and exalt your goodness, to exalt your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Father, you will never, never let us down. Help us not search in vain for things of this world to satisfy us, or to please us, or to give us acceptance and value, but help us rest in and see the beauty of what you have done and, and, and are doing. Father, we love you and we thank you. We pray this in your beautiful name. Amen. The words the Holy Spirit would call our attention to this morning come from Psalm 33. If you'll find that in your Bible, I'll give you just a moment so that you can follow along with me as the Word of God is read. This is a poem. Some of the Psalms are songs. Some of them are prayers. This one is a, a poem. It's actually written to the gathered congregation or the gathered assembly. And it speaks to the matter of worship. What is worship? We'll find out uh, something of that in just a moment. Psalm 33, I'd like to begin reading in verse 1. These are the very words God breathed from His holy lips. Okay, so what we're reading is not man-written, though it was written by a man. It originated in the breath of the true and living God. And here's what he says. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. 
The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by his great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Would you pray with me? In our Heavenly Father, we recognize you wrote these words. You brought them into existence through the pen of a man. Who that man was, we do not know. King David, perhaps, maybe someone else. But these words come from you. You desire our worship. Indeed, you demand our worship. And we offer it freely and willingly from faith-cleansed hearts. We only ask that you accept it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Worshiping in God's driven love, His driven love. You know, oftentimes uh, we emphasize doctrine from the New Testament letters especially this church. Uh, This is a great doctrinal church, and you know I love doctrine. But sometimes we get into prophecy and future events from the Old Testament prophets, and if you come on Wednesday nights, we're deep in Isaiah, and I love those prophecies and eschatology and the whole nine yards. Sometimes we look at spiritual wisdom in the wisdom literature, Psalms, Proverbs, and the like, or global missions and evangelism, What a great topic that is when we look especially into the New Testament Gospels and and all of the, the evangelism and the missions that goes on there. But when we think about all of these subjects, in thinking of all of that, sometimes we forget something. All those things, the doctrine, the prophecy, the spiritual wisdom, the white hot missions, All of those things serve one single purpose, worship. In fact, all of those things are acts of worship. We study doctrine so that we know the one that we worship in a better way and we worship him more rightly. We, we look at uh, prophecy because we see his divine hand in, in setting and knowing the end from the beginning, and we can worship him for knowing all things. We, we uh, desire spiritual wisdom. We sink ourselves into the Psalms and Proverbs. Why? Because we want to know how God desires us to behave so that we might be obedient subjects to he, our King. And then, of course, the white-hot missions in evangelism. We want everyone to come into the kingdom. We want all of them to come God's way into God's kingdom so that we can draw more glory unto His holy name. But all of these things are designed for one end, to worship the true and living and holy God. I submit to you this morning this fact. If we know the right doctrine rightly. And if we figure out all the prophecies correctly, and if we become wise in spiritual things beyond our years, and if we herald missions and evangelisms from the four corners of the earth, yet we never stop to genuinely worship the true and living and holy God, then I'm afraid we've missed the mark. Because all of those things are designed to glorify His majesty, that His people might draw glory unto His name. That's what this psalm is about. Psalm 33 begins with worship and ends with worship. Sandwiched in between are two motives for worship. They aren't the only two motives, but they are the two that the psalmist chose to showcase in this psalm. And so those are the two in which we will direct our attention this morning. 
Uh, But there's something else going on in the language here. I want to tip you off to it before we get too deep into things. Biblical commentators largely miss the most critical word in this psalm. It's the word steadfast love. You'll see it there in verse 5, verse 18, and verse 22. He drops it three times in this psalm, more or less at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. It's the Hebrew word, one word in Hebrew, chesed, chesed. We talked about it last week, we talk about it often. Probably the most important word in all of the Old Testament. Alec Moiter, the Hebrew scholar, translates it committed love. I'll speak this morning in terms of driven love, a a passionate, driven love. But it's a a word in Hebrew that has no true English equivalent. You can't come up with an English word that captures it. It's a word that is pregnant with all the biblical covenants of God mixed with His glorious virtues of love and mercy and kindness. It's just hard to really explain it in any other way. But it's this steadfast love that permeates the whole psalm. He just laced it at critical points in this poem of worship so that we wouldn't lose sight of why we're worshiping. Oh, we're worshiping because God is great and mighty. We're worshiping because He's holy and there's no one like Him. We're worshiping because all of those things, but many people can worship based upon those things. But this people in this room are worshiping from a single motive. His chesed love has reached into our hearts, saturated our hearts with His covenant-keeping, faithful, merciful love, and that draws out of us an ejaculation of worship, an excitement. You cannot contain worship if you experience that type of covenant-keeping love. It's not possible. The first word in this psalm is what? Shout! It's almost as if he couldn't get to the paper fast enough and write, shout! I mean, he just is overcome with the chesed love of Almighty God. And biblical commentators will talk about this as a psalm of general providence. Well, it talks about providence, and and we love providence here, but what drives providence? This passionate, deeply driven love that God has for His adopted children. That's what drives His providence. That's why He manipulates things in this world the way He does, because He he has a plan for His people, and He's moving His people along that historical timeline to the final day, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that His Son is Lord. And so we're going to talk about worship. God is seeking our worship, but He wants it to flow properly. He wants our worship to emerge from indescribable covenant-keeping love He has for His adopted children. So He comes into the first set of verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, and He says that driven love demands genuine worship. Driven love demands genuine worship. He starts with a rapid-fire call to worship God. Shout, he says, praise, give thanks, make melody, sing. Shout again in verse 3, loud shouts. And this is a call for the whole person to invest his whole being, her whole being, into a state of worship. You know what I mean when I say a state of worship? It's You're not thinking about the football game. You're not thinking about the the, the season upcoming. You're not thinking about uh, your 401k or got to go to work. Your whole being is totally fixed upon His glory and His majesty. There's no room in verses 1, 2, and 3 for things like The Bachelor. Oh, that was the, the 2000s, wasn't it? I'm behind the times. There's no room for things like Netflix 
No, you can watch those things at other times, but here he's calling for the, a state of being which is completely fixed on worship of the Almighty God. It's interesting when you look at the, the whole of the psalm, the name of God is mentioned 14 times in this psalm. Only one time does he use the, the proper name God or Elohim. The other 13 times... He uses the most intimate name for God, Yahweh. It is the most intimate name that God gave Himself. He first revealed it at the burning bush with Moses. You remember that event? First time we, we, uh, it's revealed to man. The name Yahweh means I was, I am, I will be forever. It's a statement, really. It's, it's a name because God gave it to himself, but it's a statement. There's none else. No one compares. I'm the God that no one compares. I'm him. But it's also the most intimate in this sense. It exalts his fatherly relationship with his adopted people. He told Moses, you go free my people from the pagans. You, my son, go free my other sons and daughters from the secular society which has enslaved them. And he tells us the same thing. We are his children. If you've ever talked with our missionary in Ecuador, Mark Cody, many of you have been to Ecuador, you know Mark, he's a great man, he's, he's devoted his life to reaching the Quechua Indians and really all of Ecuador, but he brings a wonderful perspective on God. He speaks of God as his father. When you talk with Mark, he says, have you asked the father? Have you spoken with father this morning? What does Father say? What is Father doing in your life? And he just speaks of Father. He doesn't say, my Father, your Father. He just says Father. And he brings this wonderful perspective because he has captured the essence of Psalm 33. God is not distant or far away. Yes, He is holy. Yes, He is magnificent. Yes, He is apart from sin. But He is also for His children, Father. He is your Father. He is my Father. And Father wants us to know something about His person and His passion. That's what He's unveiling in this 33rd Psalm. His person and His passion. So let's look at His person. His driven love reveals His person. Verses 4 through 11 center on Father's Word, which reveals certain things about His person. This is true not only of Almighty God, it's also true of people you come in contact with. You talk with someone and their speech belies who they are. They talk about what they're passionate about. And sadly, most oftentimes it's not God. It's sports or music or politics or whatever it is. But their speech tells you what's in their heart, what they're most passionate about. And when you look at God's speech, He tells us something. In fact, you'll see beginning in verse 4, the word of the Lord. And then again in verse 6, by the word of the Lord. Well, what does God's speech reveal about His person? Several things, actually. First, Father is morally pure. Look at verses 4 and 5. The word of the Lord, he, God states about Himself, let me, not God, Father, Father states about Himself, upright, faithful, righteous, just. What is Father doing? He's assuring you that He will never leave you and never forsake you. Even your most trusted Friends or family members will fail you in one of those areas sometime in your life. Father never will. He is 100% pure 100% of the time. And His Word says so. And His Word can never fail. He's never lied. He is morally pure. Second, Father is sovereign creator, verses 6 and 7. 
verse 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Just this week, uh, I believe it was Joe Whitten telling me that scientists have discovered new solar systems they did not know existed. Did you hear about this? They're still discovering the expanse of, of Father's creation. He hasn't even revealed everything he's created yet. He, he just gives it to us in stages so we can handle it, I suppose. But uh, there are millions of stars, innumerable galaxies. In our planet, the earth is over 70% covered by water. They tell us that at certain places that water is seven miles deep. Can you imagine how many pounds and gallons of water exist on this planet? And yet, Father gathers them like a thimble on his pinky finger. That's how big the oceans are in his presence, even less than that. He has sovereignly created our planet. You think about all the things that have to happen to sustain life. We're just close enough to the sun, any closer we'd burn. We're just far enough away, any further away we'd freeze. All the things that have to happen for oxygen and carbon dioxide and all these things we learn in science, everything has to happen perfectly to sustain life, and yet He did it, Father did it, and He did it purely on the basis of His adopted children. That's who He was creating for, setting Him into this perfect creation to enjoy and to bring glory to His name forever. What's even better, I was studying the New Testament this week in Colossians. I came across Colossians 1 verse 16, which says that Jesus was the speech that created all that you presently see. In other words, Colossians 1 16 indicates that way back in uh, Genesis 1 1, let there be light. The Father commanded it and the Son spoke it and light appeared. So is a marvelous thought. They were in perfect unison. Uh, but, but the Father is the sovereign creator. The third thing His speech reveals to us, verses 8 and 9, is Father is respected King. Verse 8, let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. He doesn't specify here of adopted children or pagan children. But He says, let all the children stand in awe of Him. Because one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that God is king and that his son is the glorious prince of his kingdom. Let them all stand in awe of him. Fourth, Father is immutably wise. Immutable is a term that's fallen out of favor in modern times. We need to recover it. It means fixed, it means unchanging, it means set in stone. I was listening to Pastor James uh, not long ago as he was teaching, and here's what immutable means. It means very simply this, God has no plan B. He has a single plan, there are not options. He set it in eternity past, Titus 1 verse 1, and he brought it to pass in real time. The fall didn't surprise him. He contemplated that when he set forth his plan. Your actions don't surprise him. Politicians don't surprise him. He set forth his plan in eternity past, and that plan was singularly focused upon an adopted children. And you have been brought into that adopted mass. It's a beautiful thing. He is immutably wise. He gets into this when he talks about the counsel of the nations versus the counsel of the Lord, the counsel of the nations. Let me trace that back for you. The counsel of the nations refers to the ungodly line of men, the secular nations. In our day and age, we call them the anti-Christian nations. Their counsel is set against God's counsel, Father's counsel. And it all began back in the Garden of Eden. You remember that Satan entered Father's perfect creation and ruined Adam's race. 
Soon thereafter, the wicked line of men began to persecute the godly line. The first example of that is wicked Cain murdered his own brother, righteous Abel. And the invisible war was in full force. The godly line being tormented and persecuted by the wicked line all the way down through history. Yet even in the garden, Father revealed his promised plan to bring forth a redeemer from that ruined human race to institute a new kingdom which will rule and reign eternally in humility and in servanthood. It's a new kingdom. The old kingdom was corrupted by pride and dominion. The new kingdom will be established on humility and servanthood. Father unfolded the details of that promised plan through various covenants revealed to our elder brothers in the faith. Noah, Abraham, King David, all of which ultimately were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice this, these various covenants, the covenant to Noah, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to King David, they all are under the umbrella or the master covenant called the covenant of grace. See, in the garden, Adam was operating under a covenant of works. He had one law and he broke it. Don't eat of the tree. He broke it. At that point, God instituted a covenant of grace and he unfolded that through these various other covenants that he gave to form a people for himself through Abraham. And then later he told King David, your line, your line, the, the new king will come from your line. And he unfolded this master covenant of grace that eventually became completely fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual covenant. But verse 11 states that it's immutable. He said, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Verse 11 stands forever, and he, he goes on to say that that plan is in his heart to all generations. It's immutable, it cannot be changed, no plan B, and it emanated from the very heart of the pure and holy God. Well, that's a little bit about his person, but I'm going to tell you, you're going you're gonna to get excited because we're going to talk about his passion. He goes in in verse 12 and begins to talk about God's passion, his driven love, that chesed love reveals Father's passion. Verses 12 through 19 narrow the focus from his expansive creation all the way down to his great passion, his adopted children. He calls us in other places the apple of his eye. This is how God speaks of his adopted children. He centers his attention on two areas, Father's oversight and Father's actions. First, his oversight, Father watches over us. You can see it in verses 12 through 15. Verse 12 says this, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. At the time those words were written, the only nation God chose was Israel. And in fact, that's the only physical nation God has ever chosen. Never do we read in Scripture that God ever chose another physical nation on this planet, nor will He. Now, it would be blasphemy against His new kingdom. But as Scripture progresses, we see the dissolution of Israel as a nation and the inauguration of a new spiritual nation with the coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus inaugurated a spiritual nation, Christendom, and began His spiritual reign in the hearts of His servants. That spiritual reign will continue throughout the ages until His glorious second coming, at his glorious second coming, he will begin his physical reign. Now, some people believe that will be in the millennial kingdom. I happen to believe that and will extend from that millennial kingdom into the eternal heavens. 
Others believe we bypass the millennial kingdom and go straight into our heavenly home. Either which way is fine with me, we end up at the same place, don't we? But regardless, the point remains, everything Father does on planet Earth revolves around how it impacts His adopted children. God views history through a single lens, His elect children. Then the Old Testament saints, now in gospel times, the saints were called. You and I, and everything that God does or everything that God allows done, He does or allows through how it will impact His adopted children, because He's driving this train to a final day. And boy, I hope that you're in Christ on the final day. But Father watches over His children. He looks down from heaven, verse 13 says. He observes everything. Father sees the children of the devil still persecuting his adopted children. He observes it all. Nothing escapes his attention. You know, even in human terms, a a human father, if you've ever been a father, how others treat your children, you cannot unremember. When your children are violated, you cannot unremember that. You cannot forget that. And and Father is our heavenly Father. He doesn't unremember. He has a long, eternal memory. He is storing up His wrath, and one day He will cast all wicked souls, body and soul, into the lake of fire. And so I want you to rest your head easily tonight knowing that Father watches over you. And the reason he does, the the originating reason is his chesed love that he has for you. Secondly, Father rescues us, verses 16 through 19. Verses 16 and 17 encourage us not to trust in the things of the world. Why would we? Father takes care of our needs. We don't need military might. We don't need uh, big horses and automobiles and chariots and so forth and Uh, financial security. These are false hopes. That's what he calls them, false hopes. Father is searching the earth to and fro for those who are resting in his steadfast love. That's what he says here. Verse 19 says that his passion is to deliver the soul. Now, we think in terms of spiritual deliverance, conversion, And that certainly is is the case here. But it also includes delivering your soul from desperate situations. As we've seen in our elder brother's testimony, King David, so many psalms. His life was at risk. God delivered his soul. At other times, he was in deep depression. God delivered him from that depression. And so there are real-life implications. But the main concern here is the spiritual conversion. Delivering the soul spiritually. I want to make a statement, and I believe it to be true. The highest manifestation of Father's glory is when He redeems an adopted child's soul from slavery to sin, to Himself, and to Satan's world system. In the New Testament, the angels are said to rejoice at that. He does that gloriously. You know, we get caught up in our day and time with miraculous gifts and tongues and healings, and and we call these miracles. Those those pale in comparison to the glory and the miracle of spiritual conversion. God, no, Father, sends His Holy Spirit to perform open-heart surgery on the sinner's heart. That operation removes his heart of stone and gives him a spiritual heart. That new spiritual heart awakens the sinner to his miserable condition before the holiness of God. That sinner cries out in faith and repentance, faith in Christ's righteousness, not his own. Repentance of his 
sin of his self and of his enslavement to Satan's world system and placing himself solely at the mercy of Almighty God. This is the gospel. I'm preaching to you the gospel. It is the highest manifestation of the Father's glory when he redeems his adopted children. He immediately extricates him from Satan's world system and places him in the kingdom of his Son, the kingdom of grace. At that point... Father does something amazing. He declares the sinner as righteous in Christ. And for the first time in that redeemed sinner's life, he can call God his Father. And not until that point, Till that point, he is the true and living God. But after he's declared righteous in Christ, he is heavenly Father. Places him in the Son's kingdom. He sanctifies him daily. Sometimes that can hurt as Father presses the sin out of us and brings situations into our life to expose our impurities so that we might repent and move closer to Him. Ultimately, He glorifies us upon death with a new glorified and eternal physical body. This, I say, is the greatest manifestation of Father's glory in heaven or on earth, and it reveals His passion for His adopted people. This is what He's driving at. In verses 12 through 19. Well, he ends the same way he began. Driven love demands spiritual worship. These last set of verses, verses 20 through 22, come back to where we started. You, 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 you You realize God's person, who he is. You realize his passion for his adopted people. And those who are his adopted people will cry out to him. Uh, they, they, they will... Uh, just have a burst of excitement, a flood of emotions. You cannot contain the worship once the adopted children realize this. And if you don't have that, then we need to go back and see if Father has adopted you. Come and talk with me, because I want Father to adopt you. And I believe Father wants to adopt you. It says here, the heart is glad, as we close, for our heart is glad in Him. I told the first service I didn't want to meddle. I promised myself I wouldn't meddle, and I couldn't contain myself. And since we are one church body, I would hate for you to lose out on my meddling, so I'll meddle a little bit. This gets fun. You loosen up a little bit now, you know, kind of unloosen the tie, because we're going to get down to business. You think about worship. I often see worship in contemporary circles where the worshiper's hearts are glad, but the glory is in the wrong place. It centers on man, it exalts man's emotions, it focuses on man's needs. There's a documentary that came out recently on Hillsong, and they even talk about their strategy to excite the emotions, unconcerned with sin, unconcerned with the holiness of God. But, but, and they readily admit this, we structure these songs to rile up man's emotions. But it's empty. Oh, everyone's happy when they leave. But man's gladness of heart soon fades as the emotions wear off. It's not genuine worship. I would submit to you they're not even worshiping at all. In fact, I would submit to you that they're engaging in idolatry because they are worshiping their own emotions. See, this is a problem. Very tricky. 
Oh, they even do the ordinances. They throw the Lord's Supper in there and they throw baptism in there and call themselves a church, but they're worshiping themselves. On the other extreme, I see worship, and some people call it the frozen chosen. You ever heard this? Ritualistic, following a liturgy that never changes, moping around in their sin. They're afraid of God. They're afraid of Father. They're afraid to lift holy hands, even though Father commands them to. They're, they're afraid, dare I say it, dare I say it. They're afraid to shout with emotional, gospel-filled joy at the top of their lungs at how much they love their Father. They're afraid to. Why are they afraid to? Because someone somewhere along the line has told them they need to worship a certain way and any other way is unacceptable. Whoever that someone was didn't read the whole counsel of God. Because I read it here and the first word says shout. And the third verse says loud shouts, plural. This is seen as undignified in such circles. And yet we find it here plain as day in Scripture. What do we do with this? And I'll, I'll say I'm not talking about the Presbyterians or the Catholics. I'm talking about Baptists. What are you afraid of? See, you're worshiping yourself too. Because when Scripture says to lift holy hands, that's a command. And you're afraid of what other people will think of you, which tells me you're worshiping yourself. I don't care if you raise your hands or not. But why you do or don't does concern me. Or if it says shout. Now, I got some problems with this myself. I'm not a shouter. My grandmother was a shouting Baptist. So I got it in my blood somewhere. I just got to somehow pull it out of there. But I'm just not much of a shouter. In fact, I... I don't like shouting, so I need to align myself with Scripture. Uh, you, you come to my house, and my kids will tell you they're, they're very loud children. And I tell them, if you want to be loud, go outside. If we want to be loud in the house or on vacation, my in-laws are here. I've gotten to where uh, in my house and on vacation, I bring earplugs with me. Because as the older I get, the screeching... It is amazing. I can hear, I cannot hear the person right in front of me, but I can hear all of this background noise, and it just, it's unbearable. So when I get to heaven, thankfully, God's not going to hand me earplugs. He's going to hand me a new set of ears, and it'll be all great. Why don't we shout? If we're serious about the regulative principles in worship, that is that God regulates how we worship, this is written to the gathered assembly. This is telling us how we are to worship. I'm not saying we shout at every service, but I wonder why we don't shout at some of them unless we're not happy. And if we're not happy, why, that leads to a whole other set of questions. Well, let me finish this way. Verse 22 states, Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Father's driven love demands our worship. I think that's explicit here. In good times, we might shout. Nothing wrong with that. In desperate times, we might shout. Or we might make melody in our hearts. Or we might pray fervently. In normal times, we typically sing and give praise and give thanks to Father. But in all times, it's always right to worship because Father's person and Father's passion rests upon His adopted people, His adopted children. And His person and His passion are fueled, don't forget this, they're fueled by His amazing, indescribable love his driven love for those children. You're one of those children. Let it out. Let out your worship to your Father. Let's pray.